Now we move to the chapter on ethics. So I'd like you to turn to the chapter on ethics and audit regulation. Uh, They are different ideas, but they're quite closely connected. And it's uh, the subject of ethics uh, that begins this chapter. Um, Yeah, okay, let's turn to the first question just straight away. Uh, The first question, logically enough, is called ethics, and it's a little five marker from not so long ago. Um, Exam question ethics. So exam question ethics. Explain the five fundamental principles of ACCA's Code of Ethics and Conduct. So here we go. So we've got um, the question ethics. Now, I'm rather fond of using a rather cute little mnemonic. It works for me. I imagine this to have been drafted by the uh, professor of uh, ethics at the ACCA. His name is Dr. Pico. And Dr. Pico defines the five ethical behavioural characteristics that one is supposed to show as an ACCA auditor, as an ACCA, basically. And uh, they are professionalism, integrity, uh, competence, confidentiality, and objectivity. Professionalism, integrity, um, uh, competence, confidentiality, and objectivity. Um, Okay, let's start. Uh, The first one is, uh, you know, it's a behavioural thing, isn't it? It's the way that you interact with other people, particularly with the clients, of course. This ethical standard, this ethical standard requires... Um, ACCA members to interact with others so as to bring credit. To bring credit, oh goodness, a bit jumpy. To bring credit to the client. Oh, I'm sorry. To the profession. Uh, This ethical standard requires ACCA members to interact with others so as to bring credit to the profession. So it's common sense stuff like you know being polite being respectful, being on time, um, being um, knowledgeable about the world and your profession specifically. Um, Yes, it's a cultural thing, isn't it? What might be professional? The world's becoming increasingly one place, isn't it, Uh, because of globalization. But strictly speaking, um, there are still differences, quite substantial ones, between uh, what we might do in the UK and what they do in the US, or more particularly, what we might do in the UK and what one might do in um, Japan, for example. So it it does have a cultural angle to it, this. So being professional is being professional within the context of auditing uh, in your local environment. Um, Okay, the next one is integrity, which frankly to me seems very, very similar to the other. Uh, This requires ACCA members to behave in a straightforward and honest fashion. And uh, it does strike me that uh, number one and number two are really very, very similar. 
Um, if, you, if you lie to a client, then that is a breach of integrity as well as a breach of professionalism. Um, if there is any slight difference between um, integrity and professionalism, personally, I would argue that, um, that well, it's very, very slight, but I would argue that professionalism is all about operating within the cultural boundaries of the profession of accountancy, whereas integrity is all about operating within the boundaries of the particular culture that you are operating, uh, so the, the, the world culture that you're operating. So integrity is all about being an honest and straightforward human being, whereas professionalism is all about being an honest and respectful and straightforward accountant. But the, it's, I think it's splitting hairs myself, and they're incredibly similar. But at least the other three are definitely different. So the next one is C, should we say confidentiality first? Confidentiality. Uh, this idea requires auditors to keep the client's secrets. And frankly, for me, that's the answer to the question. But if I do a word count on that, I don't think it's going to come up to my um, pre preferred 15 words. Um, this idea requires auditors to keep the client's secrets. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's not far off, but it's not there yet. Um, so what I might do is I might extend the answer to mention confidentiality overrides. There are certain circumstances under which you blow the whistle, as they say. You blow the whistle on the client and you go straight to the police. Except in rare circumstances, called confidentiality. overrides and they are extremely rare and we'll have a look at those in the next question ok so that's that one um, the next C is the probably the easiest of all which is competence competence um Competent is almost impossible to measure in the context of most business careers. Um, it's really, really difficult to measure the competence, for example, of a football player. Um, if we take, for example, a football player that plays up front, um, then you might expect to be able to measure his competence by the number of goals that he scores. Uh, but come to think of it, if you have a brilliant player who should really be scoring goals, but for some reason they're not coming but he keeps providing goals for other players, then is he competent or incompetent? Well, you'd probably argue that he was competent. So measuring competence is very difficult in that particular case. Um, competence in the context of being a chef. Um, the chef maybe doesn't have three stars given to him by Michelin, but that chef has always managed to keep his customers happy. Basically, he's operating within a small budget and he produces delicious food. And the restaurateur is happy because the customers are happy. Would you say that he's incompetent because he hasn't got three stars? Hardly. He's competent. But it's a very touchy-feely thing in the context of a football player and in the context of a chef, in the context of a, a, a lecturer, in the context of a bricklayer. Um, it's difficult to measure uh, competence precisely in the context of these professions. But the wonderful thing about audit is it's really black and white. It is very easy to measure the competence of an auditor because we have these things called the ISA, 
and are the rules by which we must behave. So if we follow the international standards on auditing, then we're competent. And if we fail to follow those rules, we're incompetent. Or actually, to be honest with you, because this all gets tied up in law, we tend to use a legal phrase for this. We have what is called a legal duty of care to be competent. And you may remember from your law studies that a breach of a duty of care is called negligence. So the two sides of the coin are called competent and negligent. Not competent and incompetent, but competent and negligent. So if you follow the ISA, you're competent. If you fail to do so, you're negligent. Okay, well, that's easy enough. Let's write that down. An auditor is competent if he stroke she follows the international standards on auditing. Um, and then we have O. O for objectivity. O for objectivity. Well, an auditor is required to be objective in order to give an objective opinion on the true and fair view of financial statements. An auditor is required to... Well, I'll tell you what, let me stop here for a second and I'm going to use this phrase that seems to be missing from Dr. Pico. P is professionalism, um, I is integrity, I is integrity, C is competence, C is confidentiality, and O is objectivity. There's a really, really important phrase that seems to be missing from um, Dr. Pico. And it's... Um, it's one that has been referred to in the previous question on uh, the audit report. It's independence. Why is it that independence is not within these five ethical guidelines? Well, the answer is it is, but it's hidden by this word objectivity. So I'm going to use it now. I'm going to use objectivity and independence uh, interchangeably to try and create a sentence that looks convincing. An auditor is required to... Be independent, independent of the client in order to give an objective. opinion on the financial statements. An auditor is required to be independent in order to give an objective opinion on the financial statements. Yes, that's a good point, actually. Let's come back to that. It's a bit jerky, this, isn't it? Let's see if I can bring this up. An auditor is required to be independent of the client. Yes, that's a good point, isn't it? What does it mean to be independent of the client? Well, you remember you've got the directors and you've got the shareholders, and we work for the shareholders. Make sure you're clear on this. Independent of the client means independent of the directors. It's independent of the company. Obviously, we should be dependent upon the shareholders because those are the people that we work for. So we're going to be dependent upon the shareholders, but independent of the client, independent of the, the company itself and the directors within that company. Okay, that's fine. I'm happy with that. That's the end of that question and the start 
of the next question. The next question is AB and co. Now, um, whilst you do get very dry questions like the question ethics that you saw just a moment ago, this question AB and co is frankly the more common one where you're required to um, deal with scenarios and discuss independence within a scenario rather than simply just list the features of an ethical auditor you're actually required to deal with a practical situation. And this uh, rather cute question is from a little while back, and it asks us to work through five little mini-situations. So let's have a look at that. It is important that an auditor's independence is beyond question, and that he should behave with integrity, objectivity, and objectivity in all professional and business situations. The following are a series of questions which were asked by auditors of A, B, and Co. at a recent update seminar on professional ethics. A, can I audit my brother's company, ah, etc., etc., etc. Discuss the answers you would give to the above questions posed by the auditors. So the question is A, B, and Co. The question is A, B, and Co. A. Uh, no, you can't audit your brother's company. Actually, let's use another phrase, uh, conflict of interest. Conflict of interest is what you have if you have a breach of independence stroke objectivity. There would be a conflict of interest. if you audited your brother's company. You cannot audit this client as you wouldn't be able to be objective. You cannot audit this client as you would not be objective. You cannot audit this client as you would not be objective, which is fine, isn't it? It's dead easy. And like a lot of things in audit, it looks really easy. But what we've got to do is we've got to go back to that and get a second point because there's two marks. That's just one idea then. You know, no is one idea. So we have to go back and we have to see if we can think of something else we can say, which is not so easy. Uh, I'll give you what the examiner went for, which I think is quite cute. He says, what if you'd never met your brother before? What if you grew up uh, in South London with your granny, <laughs> your father's mother? You grew up in South London with your granny, but your brother uh, grew up in Mauritius with your mum, and you'd never met your brother before, um, and you're not particularly interested in him. I don't know if this is terribly likely, but if you've never met your brother before, if you've never met your brother before, and you don't have any particular strong emotional bond with that fella, you are actually independent. So the truth of the matter in my little story, in the examiner's little story, the truth of the matter is, I am independent. I don't have any, I don't hate my brother, but I don't particularly like him. I don't really know him. I don't have any emotional connection with this guy who happens to be my brother. So I really am independent. Can I do the audit now? I am independent. Can I do the audit now? The examiner says, no. Why is that? Not only must you be independent, but you must be seen to be independent. Perceptions. That's what he went for for his second mark. Perceptions. 
perceptions. Even if there was no conflict. The perception would be that you have an emotional relationship with your bro brother. Even if there was no conflict, the perception would be that you have an emotional relationship with your brother. So under no circumstance can you do this audit. So under no circumstance can you do this audit. Right, fine, okay. Um, have I got my two marks there? I have, haven't I? I've got one for saying, no, you can't do the audit, and the other one for saying, no, you can't do the audit, even if there's no emotional relationship, because the perception would be that there is. So that's my two marks for A. So I guess I'm ready for B. Um, can I prepare the financial statements of a public company and still remain as auditor? Um, well, you might guess straight off the answer is no. You can't possibly audit yourself. Public FS audit. You cannot produce public financial statements. You cannot produce public financial statements uh, for a public company. and then go and audit them. Because you cannot be independent of yourself. Uh, you cannot produce public financial statements for a public company and then go and audit them because you cannot be independent to yourself. Imagine if you've got a five-day job. I've done this. Believe it or not, I've done this. And as you'll see in a moment, you'll find out that it still goes on to this day. Imagine you've got a five-day job, okay? On day one, two, three, four, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you're drafting the financial statements. Then you go home on Thursday night. On a Friday, you come back and you're the auditor. And you open up the financial statements and say, oh, wow, nice financial statements. So well written, so clear, so beautifully presented. Whoa, I wonder who did this drafting. I wonder who produced these financial statements. I don't think so. How can you be independent to yourself? How can you produce financial statements and then audit those financial statements whilst being independent of the person who produced the financial statements. It's not possible, is it? And yet, in most countries, you can, providing the company isn't public. So for, pro for private company financial statements, you can do this mad thing. It's got to change, hasn't it? In the US, you can't, under no circumstances. If you audit, you can't do the financial statement preparation. So in the US, you can't. But here... 
And in most countries, you can. It's really weird, and I, I suggest it has to change. But we don't have to suggest to the marker because there's only two marks, so we'll just knock it out. Private company FS audit Surprisingly, in most countries, you are, you are allowed to draft private company FS and then audit your own work. Surprisingly, in most countries, you are allowed to draft private company FS and then audit your own work. It might seem a bit bizarre, it might seem a bit mad, but at least it's a mark. That's the important thing, right? Okay, part C. My client has threatened to sue the firm for negligence. Can I still remain as auditor? No, you can't. Part C. Uh, conflict. What could be a you know, more obvious conflict than having a legal scrap with someone? Well, I suppose you could have a fight in the street, couldn't you? That's possibly even more emotional but it's pretty flipping close to a fighting... Uh, fighting court is pretty flipping close to um, a fight uh, on the street. So clearly, if you're in conflict with someone, you're going to have some emotions. Hate, presumably. It is not possible to be in a legal battle with a client and remain objective. It is not possible to be in a legal battle with a client and remain objective. So you must Resign. So you must resign. Um, but it's a two marker, so you have to say something else. And you could say almost anything you like, but the most obvious thing is this. If you've been threatened um, with litigation by your client because they think you're negligent, then they think you're rubbish. If they think you're rubbish, surely you're going to be sacked before you'll get to resign. So isn't the question a bit daft? Removal. So let's get our second mark by pointing out that the question itself is odd. Removal. But the question is odd because surely you will you will be removed um, before you can resign. So that's what I'm su going to suggest as a second point in the context of part C. Uh, D is easy enough. I am a student of the Chartered Association of Certified Accountants. Am I bound by the ethical guidelines of the association? Of course, if you're a student, you're still a student member. And therefore, yes, you are bound by Dr. Pico. C. Student. A student... 
is a student member. Uh, so, of course, he or she is bound by the ethical guidelines. So, of course, he stroke she is bound by the ethical guidelines. Or ethical guidelines. And Again, it's easy to get the first mark, hard to get the second one. Um, student. A student is a student member, so of course he, she is bound by the ethical guidelines. But I suggest the second mark might be for explaining to the examiner that the application of the rules might be slightly different for a student member as they are for a partner. For example, a partner would be expected to actually resign from um, an audit if they had the kind of conflict that we saw earlier in um, parts A, B and C but um, obviously there's not going to be any resignation from an audit taking place here if you're a student member um, but you would let, let, me, let me show you what I mean if, um, if you as an audit partner are the brother of the financial director then you can't do the audit at all and you'd have to resign from the audit and you wouldn't be able to do the audit as a firm. The firm wouldn't be able to do the audit. But if you are a student member on the audit team and your brother is working in accounts, then the firm doesn't have to resign from the audit. All you do is say, I'm sorry, I can't do this particular audit because I have a conflict of interest. My brother works in accounts. You'll have to send me on another job. So it's kind of applying, but not exactly in the same way. And I think that's what I'm going to suggest as the second mark. Application. However, the application in practice For a partner and a student might be different. However, the application in practice for a partner and a student might be different. Okay, fair enough. Um, that's our D. And now our E. E. If I discover evidence of money laundering, should I continue to protect client confidentiality and therefore keep quiet? Well, again, it's another no, isn't it? E. Yeah, money laundering. Money laundering. Um, the above is one of very few situations where the auditor should go straight to the authorities and reveal the client's secrets, which is otherwise completely banned. And these situations are very, very few, actually, very few. Money laundering is one example, and the others are really extreme. There are things like um, terrorism, um, treason, and murder, and so forth. Um, particularly the first two, and the third one, murder, in the context of being, you know, asked to give evidence in court 
about conversations you overheard when you were at the client, something like that. They're really quite specific and um, as an auditor they're a bit difficult to get hold of and that's again why it's two marks because there's very specific advice at the ACCA. If we do decide that we have to go whistleblowing, as it's called, and enact a, a confidentiality override and go straight to the authorities and release the client's secrets, um, if we get this wrong, we're going to get sued. And if we get sued and we've got this wrong, then we're going to go down. So what are we? We're auditors. Who are we? We're auditors. What do we know about this legal stuff? Nothing. So what the ACCA says is if you think that you have to enact a confidentiality override, if you think you have to whistleblow, before you go to the authorities, go to a lawyer. However, the ACCA recommend we discuss the confidentiality override with a lawyer. First. However, the ACCA recommend we discuss the confidentiality override with a lawyer first. How's that? Yeah, that's good, isn't it? So we're done. Fantastic. So um, there's another question in the bag as regards um, audit ethics and regulation, uh, which leaves us um, a couple of questions to do, but they've got a, quite a different feel, these two. Um, the next two questions we're going to do cover the process of um, appointment and removal. So we've got appointment and removal, and uh, we'll look at those in a moment.